Hey everybody, welcome to the Mana League. I'm John as always, and it's day two of the Ravnica Allegiance set review. Hopefully you all enjoyed the pre-pre-release yesterday. I was there judging it and it was super, super fun. But today we're going to take a look at all of the blue cards in Ravnica Allegiance. Now remember, this is a limited only set review. We're not talking about any constructed formats, just draft and to a lesser extent sealed. These, of course, are my first glance opinions on these cards, how I'm going to be approaching them next week when I first start playing with it. And I want you to discuss this. I, I'm not trying to tell you the truth here. I'm trying to get a discussion going, so use those comments down below to talk with me, talk with each other. Just talk. Now, just before we jump into the set review, I do want to do something very exciting here and talk about Inked Gaming for a second, and how you can get a free playmat. You might know I'm an Inked Gaming affiliate. Use the promo code MANALEAK10, all one word, one zero is the uh, number, to get 10% off your order at Inked Gaming, but I am now an Inked Gaming sponsored affiliate, which means... I get more support from them and I work more closely with them, which can also mean some more giveaways for you guys. So if you go over to twitch.tv slash the Mana League and you check out my stream on January 17th, where I'll be playing Ravnica Allegiance as it will have come out on both MTGO and Magic Arena. I don't know which one I'm going to play it on just yet. You will get a chance to win a playmat. If you haven't checked out my streams before, we do marble races during the streams. Marble races are basically a fancy way of doing a randomized giveaway. We actually play them for fun and keep track of points with the leaderboard system, but I also do use them when we do giveaways. So we'll be doing a Marble Grand Prix, which means for everybody who is there that day, we will do a series of races and the overall point total winner will get themselves a playmat. So go check that out, twitch.tv slash TheManaleek on January 17th, and go check out Inked Gaming and use the promo code MANALEAK10 if you do buy something there for 10% off your order. But let's get on into the first card. We've got Arrester's Admonition. Arrester's Admonition is two and a blue for an instant at common. Return target creature to its owner's hand, my favorite words. Addendum, if you cast this spell during your main phase, draw a card. So it's, uh, it's three mana on summon, which... Used to cost one mana, that's a heck of a price hike, but I'll still gladly pay it. Bounce is great, it kills those pesky spirit tokens, it paves the way for attacks, it buys you time, it's just super, super versatile. The beauty here, I think, is that if you're being tempo-y, there, there's no real problem casting this main phase to clear the way for attacks and get that extra card draw too. This likely isn't first pickable unless the pack is truly weak, but I'll look to draft as many of these as I can. I, I would be happy if this was my most drafted card. B minus for Arrester's Admonition. Benthic Biomaster is up next. Benthic Biomancer, I said Biomaster. Biomancer is a single blue mana for a creature merfolk wizard mutant. Welcome to Simic. We're gonna we're gonna say a lot of creature types. For at rare, it's a one one. You can pay one a blue to adapt one. Adapt is basically monstrous. Uh, you pay the cost and you get that many counters put on the creature. Typically, nothing happens, um, but you get those counters put on your creature. You can only do it if it does not have any counters on it. So you can only do it once unless you move those counters. But Benthic Biomancer does do something. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on Benthic Biomancer. Draw a card, then discard a card. You loot. So, boy, oh boy, oh boy, is this not a rare that I want to open. And I actually, I, I, I'm going to say that a lot this set. There's a lot of rares that I just don't want to open because it doesn't feel that good. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to win me any games, really. But as a creature, it is fine. It's totally fine. The good case scenario here is that it's a 2-2 haste on turn two that loots. That's totally fine. Later in the game, off the top of the deck, it's a three mana 2-2 that loots, basically. Uh, also okay, but again, not earth shattering. If you really pull off some Simic shenanigans of moving counters, there, there are some ways to do that. There are some cards that will give it counters beyond the adapt counter. Then I think you might have some cool extra looting going on here, but I still don't think it ever really gets above a C+. So C+, for Benthic Biomancer, not the rare I want to see, but I'll always play it. I'm just going to pick it way later than first pick. Up next is Chillbringer. Chillbringer is four and a blue for a creature elemental at common. It's a 3-3 flyer, apparently. I can barely tell that from the art. When Chillbringer enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Yeah, I'm never going to realize this thing flies. It barely looks like it's flying. Anyways, a 3-3 flyer for five is not ideal, but it's fine. But having the ability to freeze is really good, especially if you're in the flyer deck and this is kind of your top end and you've already got a couple of flyers out and this uh, taps down their, 
you know, only flyer or only reacher or even just taps down a creature to stop them from trying to race with you. Uh, not a card that I'm super excited by, and I certainly don't want multiples of it in, in really any deck, but I think the first one is probably a totally okay C+. Not really a strong C+, but a totally fine C+. Play it, just don't break your back trying to pick it up early in the draft or anything like that. Clear the Mind is up next. Clear the Mind is two and a blue for a sorcery at common. Target player shuffles their graveyard into their library. Draw a card. Uh, no, just just garbage. This doesn't do anything. Shuffling your graveyard in is like sort of cool in theory because those cards come back, but they don't. You still have to draw them. Um, and, and you're paying three mana at sorcery speed to do this and get a card. So it's like half a divination for the same cost. Uh, just no, no deck can afford a card slot for this. I, I think it's unplayable and I'll barely keep it above an F minus at a D or at, a, at an F at a D minus, because if you, if your game one goes long and you end up milling yourself out, maybe you can put this in as a way to stop that. But at that point, you're probably just going to time anyways. Not, not a fan D minus for clear the mind. Code of Constraint is up next. Code of Constraint is two and a blue for an instant at uncommon. Target creature gets minus four, minus zero until end of turn. Draw a card. Addendum. If you cast this spell during your main phase, tap that creature and it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So here's the secret. This is an aggro card and you want to cast it in your main phase. Three mana, draw a card and freeze a creature is just about the dream of a tempo aggro deck. You get a blocker out of the way, you get another card back into your hand and you're just going to get through some extra damage with this. And then if you do find that you need to use this defensively and use it to debuff an attacking creature, sure, that's that's fine too. Uh, I think this will surprise people. I, I think this is going to be a very fine, very strong C plus that I'm probably going to be playing in every blue deck, but especially in the Azorius Tempo Aggro deck. So C plus for Code of Constraint. Up next is Coral Commando. Coral Commando is two and a blue for a creature Merfolk Warrior at common with a bunch of flavor text. That's it. Also, it took me a while to actually see the merfolk. I thought it was like a seahorse thing. Uh, yeah, it's a 3-2 for 3, vanilla. That's it. That's literally it. There's nothing else going on here. It's very c minus -y. Play this only when you didn't get 23 playable cards. You should be able to get better creatures than this. If you didn't, that sucks. Here you go. c minus for Coral Commando. Not much else to say. Up next is Essence Capture. Essence Capture is blue blue for an instant at uncommon counter target creature spell. Put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. As we recently talked about, Benthic Biomancer, you could throw a counter on it and get an extra loot. Um, you know, countering creature spells is significantly better and limited than non-creature because you just see way more creatures than you don't. You, What do you want in your usual deck? 15, 16 creatures. That doesn't leave many non-creature spaces. But I'm still not super sold on this. Counter spells either need to have a great upside, usually card advantage, or at least scrying or surveilling, and they need to exist in a format with a solidly controlling deck, which I'm not sure really exists in this format. Blue white seems a lot more tempo skies, no time for counter spells, and blue green seems a lot more ramp and big dumb things no time for counter spells. So I'm not sure if this is going to have a spot in the format. I think realistically, this is like a C plus people who unabashedly love counter spells will play this more often. I don't think it's correct. C minus for essence capture. Up next is eyes everywhere. Eyes everywhere is two and a blue for an enchantment at uncommon at the beginning of your upkeep scry one. Also, you can pay five and a blue and exchange control of eyes everywhere and a target non land permanent. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. So as I said yesterday, there's a lot of really, really, really bad enchantments in this set, like absolutely awful ones, and this is not one of them. This is basically Thassa from Theros. She was two in a blue and she scried every turn. Obviously, she became an indestructible god and had another ability, but this is basically Thassa, or at least Thassa early on. And blue decks are just going to love this. Scry every turn is very, 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 very powerful. Think about how powerful Surveil was on Night Veil Sprite, which was typically every turn. This is basically the same thing, except it happens every turn. You don't even have to attack. Then, in the late game, there's a big bomb over there. You pay five and a blue. You take that bomb. You give them a scry every turn. You give them a very powerful effect, but you took their bomb and they're maybe just dead next turn. That sounds great to me. I love this card. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna first pick it if there's no bombs or removal. And I'm gonna play this card really, really, really high. I'm gonna start this at a B. Oh, I was gonna say plus. Um, 
No, I'm going to keep this at a B. I'm not going to go quite crazy with a B plus. Obviously, it goes down a little bit if your opponent is blue as well, because they could just give you this back if they can pay five and a blue. But I'm going to keep eyes everywhere as a B. Up next is Fairy Duelist. Fairy Duelist is one and a blue for a creature Fairy Rogue at common. It's a 1-2 with flash with flying. And when Fairy Duelist enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus two, minus zero until end of turn. Um, it, it's a cute trick and it leaves behind a, a maybe relevant body. Uh, I've been burned many, 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 many times in the past by not liking 1-2 flyers for two with text. So I'm going to try to head that off here and look at this very optimistically. Having flash means that it's a great chump blocker. The minus two might actually make it kill something and live, or more likely allow another of your creatures to block and eat that creature. Uh, this is probably just fine. I'm gonna start this at a solid C plus, hopefully not totally get burned by giving a low grade to a one, two flyer with relevant text again. Um, I think you probably always play the first one of these. So C plus for fairy duelist. Up next is Gateway Sneak. Gateway Sneak is two and a blue for a creature Videlkin Rogue at Uncommon. It's a 1-3. Whenever a gate enters the battlefield under your control, Gateway Sneak can't be blocked this turn. Whenever Gateway Sneak deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. As I said uh, before, or at least I think I said yesterday, the gate deck looks, to me, a little bit better in Ravnica Allegiance. There's more payoffs, I think, just in general, and they're all pretty decent. This one's pretty decent. In that gate deck, I think this is like a B minus, but only if you do have a lot of gates because you need to make sure that she is rather continuously unblockable. Without gates, it goes way, way, way lower, uh, um, but there are enough gate payoffs that I think I, I think the deck might actually feel more real to me in this set. It, it's not quite so much of, was there a glaive? Cool, you got into the, the gate deck. There was not a glaive? Cool, there was no gate deck in your pod. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got gateway sneak at like a B minus is probably too high. I'm going to put her at a C plus if you're in that gate deck. And if you're not, she's a very, 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 very cuttable, uh, like D, I would say. D plus, we'll say. C plus, D plus for gateway sneak. Up next is Humungulus. Humungulus is a humongous homunculus. Uh, humungulus is four and a blue for a creature homunculus at common. It's a two five and it's got hexproof. Yay. Yeah, Hexproof, my favorite mechanic. A uh, mechanic that I, I'm very confident needs to stop being printed, uh, or at least be, needs to be much more conditional. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be really annoying. It's a two five for five, which isn't great, and this doesn't attack that well, so I'm not as afraid of this as I'm afraid of something like Night Vale Predator or something like that. Um, but all it takes is just some stupid auras or counters put on this, and suddenly you basically literally can't deal with it because any sort of power toughness boost is going to put this way out of range of ever being blocked and killed because it's going to be like six or seven or eight toughness yeah not a huge fan not a huge fan of uh hexproof being printed i, I i'm going to give this an f because of hexproof uh, in reality in reality it's like a c um I, I think some blue decks will be relatively happy to play this i say i think other blue decks might be a little bit too aggro-y or uh uh, just not wanting to bother with a, a dumb five drop. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll keep this at a C. It's going to be obnoxious in some games and Hexproof needs to stop being printed. C for Humungulus. Mass Manipulation is up next. Mass Manipulation is X, X, blue, 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 blue. That's four blue. For a sorcery at rare, gain control of X target creatures and or planeswalkers. Now, in Ravnica Allegiance, there are three planeswalkers, which means you will ever so slightly see more, but you'll still potentially just never see any because planeswalkers are not that common so don't expect to be stealing a whole bunch of planeswalkers with this realistically you're just stealing some creatures even more realistically you're stealing a creature because to steal a creature you have to pay six mana you're looking at paying eight mana to get two creatures and eight mana is not all that common to get to in a game of magic getting three creatures is basically just out of the question ultimately this is probably fine but you need to be blue we talked about niv mizzet's triple blue and of course triple red being tagged onto that being a very restrictive casting cost this is probably just as restrictive you need a lot of gates or you need to be very 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 heavy blue i think in weaker packs you do first pick this but you need to know immediately when you should cut it and that's going to be when you just don't have the fixing needed to uh, reliably cast this so i'm going to keep this at a b but you need to cut this if you're lacking on gates or, or lacking on islands in your deck. B for mass manipulation. 
Up next is Mesmerizing Benthid. Mesmerizing Benthid is three blue blue for a creature octopus at Mythic. When Mesmerizing Benthid enters the battlefield, create two zero two blue illusion creature tokens with whenever this creature blocks a creature, that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. And that's it. These are illusions, and yes, illusions usually die when they get targeted. These ones don't. Keep that in mind. Also, Mesmerizing Benthid has hexproof as long as you control an illusion. This, unlike Humungulus, is a very cool bit of conditional hexproof. This creature is big, relatively, as a 4-5, and has hexproof for an amount of time, as long as those O2s live. Basically, it's a cold water snapper that has two little O2 buddies that freeze a creature if they block. Now, those creatures are probably going to die if they block those creatures, so you're not going to have them around forever if you are blocking, and this creature will eventually lose that hexproof. Um, I, I don't know if I can really go any higher than a B- on this. For as interesting as cool as it sounds, it is just a five mana version of cold water snapper that eventually loses hexproof. So it, it's not the mythic that I super want to see, but I think it also goes in every single blue deck ever, and you're pretty darn happy to play it, and you probably just first pick it. It, it is good. Do not make any assumptions that I uh, downgraded this or don't like it. It is quite good, but I think it is just around the B- minus level without having any sort of evasion or anything like that. B- minus for Mesmerizing Benthid. Up next is Persistent Petitioners. Persistent Petitioners is one in a blue for a creature human advisor at common. It's a 1-3. You can pay one and tap it target player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. You can tap four untapped advisors you control. Target player puts the top 12 cards, holy moly, of their library into their graveyard. A deck can have any number of cards named Persistent Partitioners, which of course is flavor text and limited because you already can have any number of any card in your deck in limited. There's no four of restriction. So yes, this does say advisors you control, but there's not actually that many advisors in the entire set. So really, you're just looking at persistent petitioners. And uh, to be the bearer of bad news, the average draft has two copies of any given common, meaning you're probably never, ever going to tap four untapped advisors you control, which means all of this card is flavor text except for the first ability, which is horrendous. Milling one card a turn and paying mana for that is going to do literal actual nothing. This card is super, super awful. Uh, realistically, it's a D minus because it's a one three. It's a creature that you can put in your deck. But just to just to send home the message, this is an F F for persistent practitioners, petitioners, not practitioners. They're very similar words. Up next is Precognitive Perception. Precognitive Perception is three blue blue for an instant at rare. Draw three cards. Addendum, if you cast a spell during your main phase, instead scry three, then draw three cards. So this is another rare that I don't really want to see in my rare slot, but is still a good card. It, it's, a, it's a card called Jace's Ingenuity if you take off the addendum. Uh, but if you do cast it in your main phase, you get to set up those draws. That's totally fine. This is not exciting. It's... It's not a rare you want to see, as I said, but I think if your blue deck has any plans of going even slightly late game, then this is a very solid pickup that you just cast as an instant and it will be super fine. And if you can or want to cast it in the main phase, it gets a little bit better. People are really down on addendum and yes, casting instants as sorceries isn't the most super duper mega efficient, I'm the best pro player ever way of doing things, but think it through. There's definitely times where your opponent's top decking their out of cards. You have no need to be pretending to hold something up. So just cast this in the main phase and get the bonus. It's not going to happen very often, and you shouldn't cast this in the main phase very often. But there are going to be times where you can, and that's a cool little bonus. Like the other 80% of the time, pretend you have your counter spell, and then draw your three cards instead. Uh, yeah, I, I think this card is fine. I think it's like a B-. minus. The, the instant speed aspect of this is great. Um, so yeah, B-, minus. not a rare I want to see but a very solid card for every blue deck. B- minus for Precognitive Perception. Up next is Prying Eyes. Prying Eyes is four blue blue for an instant at common. Draw four cards, then discard two cards. It's pricey, but it's some serious card selection late in the game, so it's probably a relatively okay top deck. And being instant means you can wait to cast it. You can hold up your counter spells or whatnot, or you can pretend to hold up your counter spells and then cast this. It's probably an okay card for a blue deck that isn't quite on board the tempo aggro train and is trying to be a little bit more controlly. Um, probably around 
around a C plus in that deck and a, a C minus ish on average, just because this card sucks so bad to be in your hand. Basically any time that isn't turn six or later. And even then in some games, you won't have six mana yet. Uh, the other downside is kind of if your hand is empty, this is a double the cost divination, but there is still some cost. There is still some card selection, so it's not as awful, but still definitely expensive. So C minus C plus kind of depends on the deck that it's in. Up next is Terramander. Terramander is a single blue mana for a creature Salamander Drake. Uh, that's actually an axolotl on the uh, on the card, which is a type of salamander. It's an uncommon 1-1 one, one with flying, and you can pay 7 and a blue to adapt 4 to make it into a 5-5 five, five flyer. However, there's more. This ability costs 1 less to activate for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. Here we come, blue-red spells. Is it's not in this set. Um, I, I doubt you're rapidly turning on this ability like you would in a blue-red deck. Uh, so we've got a 1-1 one, one flyer for 1, which, meh, it's as bad as Healer Hawk, which was an awful card. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not my favorite thing unless there's a way to abuse it, um, put some counters on it or something sooner than turn 8, preferably. Turn 8 is way too late for that ability. The game should be over by then in, in the vast majority of games. But if we can get two spells in the yard, then it's 6, which is probably fine. A 5-5 five, five flyer for 6 assuming this lived the whole time, is probably a card I would just play, I think, 100% uh, of the time in sealed anyways. Um, ultimately, this is probably just fine, but you're also generally living the life of your opponent knowing this is coming, and any ping, burn, kill spell just ends that plan. I don't expect this to be super good, and I, I, I don't think I want to start out playing this, but I think it's probably fine. So I'm going to say it's a C+. I'm going to say you probably do play it when you have a spot, uh, which is actually the definition of a C. So let's downgrade that to C for Terramander. Love the art, though. I love axolotls. They're very cute. Up next is a card that many thought should have been my preview card, although I'm pretty happy with my preview card. It's Quench. Quench is one in a blue for an instant at common counter target spell unless its controller pays to. It's a bad mana leak, just like me. Uh, so yeah, apparently Mana Leak is too strong for standard, it seems, if we're getting just literally the same card, but slightly weaker. Uh, still, two mana counter unless they pay two is probably fine if you're a controlly blue deck. Uh, I'm not sure if that'll exist, though. As I said, I think blue-white is a, a tempo attack em, bounce creatures kind of thing, not really into the counter spell plan. Um, and and blue-green is ramp and do big dumb things with counters. Um, remember, this is basically a counter spell pre-turn four or five it's just going to counter everything pre-turn four or five usually and then post turn five it rapidly becomes a dead card the more and more and more mana your, your opponent gets uh because you know they might have seven mana but they're not dropping seven drops left and right they're still dropping three drops four drops even five drops this still doesn't counter so ultimately i think this is just a c and i think a lot of decks do readily cut it uh in fact i would actually drop this down to a c minus i think c minus for quench up next is Sage's Row Savant. Sage's Row Savant is one in a blue for a creature Videlkin Wizard at common. It's a 2-1. When Sage's Row Savant enters the battlefield, scry two. It's fine, but it's not terribly exciting. It's very filler, very cuttable, but in a tempo aggro deck, it could be okay. If this comes down on two, scries two, fixes up your next couple of draws, and maybe gets in for two once. It's okay. It's not awful. I think it's still a C. I, I, I think you play this if you need it, and you don't play it if you just have better stuff. So C for Sage's Row Savant. Up next is Senate Courier. Senate Courier is two and a blue for a creature bird at common. It's a 1-4 flying with uh, pay one and a white to give it vigilance until end of turn. It's also really, really, really nice art. That's a pretty owl. Anyways, this is not the tempo aggro flyer that I want for a blue-white skies deck. Three mana is a little bit of a discount for five total power and toughness, but a one four just doesn't really do what I want to be doing. Getting vigilance for a mana makes this better because then you can attack and block, which, you know, it wants to ping in for a damage and it really wants to block, which a, a one four certainly is built for. But still, I think this is kind of at best a C and might even be a little bit more of a side card, a sideboard card if you do find out that you really need a four toughness blocker. So I'm going to go with a C on Senate Courier, but a B plus for that pretty owl. Up next is Shimmer of Possibility. Shimmer of Possibility is one in a blue for a sorcery at common. Look at the top four cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Sorcery speed hurts this a lot. This is not an anticipate. This costs you a turn early in the game. Turn two 
cost you a turn. Turn three, probably cost you a turn. Turn four might still cost you your entire turn. And that's a, a huge cost to me. Getting any card and not having to reveal it is kind of nice, but it's just not a big enough upside for me. This will be a, a hard C minus, I think. I'm going to cut this basically whenever I can. And I, I actually will kind of feel bad playing it. So I, I think I'm actually going to put this at a D plus. I don't really want to play a Shimmer of Possibility. Up next is Skatewing Spy. Skatewing Spy is three and a blue for a creature Videlkin Rogue Mutant at Uncommon. It's a two, three. You can pay five and a blue to adapt two. Each creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it has flying. Skipping ahead a few days, I like the green adapt payoff more than I like this one, but this one is still solidish if, if you're definitely going deep on adapt or, or otherwise getting counters on creatures. And you've got the mana. Uh, a, a two, three for four is awful. That's really bad, and it's not a 4-5 until it turns 6 at the earliest, but then it flies, as do all of your other adapts, so, so it is a heck of a payoff, and I, I think just not planning to adapt this is the better plan. And by what I mean by that is, is make sure that you have adapt creatures, preferably cheaper ones like Benthic Biomancer or the, uh, the Flyer that we'll see later, and plan to adapt them and get counters and everything else, and they'll still get flying. You don't have to adapt this in order to get the flying to happen, and then when you have the chance adapt sca uh, skate wing spy um so i think this is certainly a build around and i think it's like a b plus in the adapt heavy deck with a smaller amount of adapt it, this does drop a fair bit though so let's say a b plus in the uh the in the in the place where it belongs anyways b plus for skate wing spy know when to cut it because if you have no adapt somehow you might still cut it up next is Skittering Eel. Skittering Eel is three and a blue for a creature of fish crab, of course. At common, it's a three, three, pay two and a blue, adapt two, so you get to make it a five, five. I think this is just fine. A three, three for four is overcosted. You generally avoid playing that. It would be a C minus. But the next turn, it's a five, five. That's still not amazing without any sort of evasion or anything, so I still don't think I'm going to go above a C here. Obviously, it does get better if you combine with various other shenanigans like Skatewing Spy or whatnot, but without a reason, I'm just going to put this at a C. Obviously better in some situations. C for skittering, Skitter Eel. Slimebind is up next. Slimebind is gross. One in a blue for an enchantment aura at common. It's got flash, enchant creature, enchanted creature gets minus four, minus zero. Uh, so we just talked yesterday about how removal that allows a creature to continue to block isn't that great. But it's way less bad when that creature doesn't have any power left. Having flash on this and only two mana is great. This will be a solid removal and, and flyers can just go over the top of it, even if that creature still does have one or two power or something. Uh, I think this should be a somewhat high pick after bombs and real removal and is probably going to be around a B minus. I, I think this card is just secretly very solid. Uh, don't sleep on slime bind. I think it's very decent. B minus for slime bind. All right, let me tell you about possibly the best rare in the set. Sphinx of Foresight is two blue blue for a creature Sphinx at rare. It's a four four. You may reveal this card from your opening hand. If you do, scry three at the beginning of your first upkeep. It has flying and at the beginning of your upkeep, you scry one. You scry one every single turn. This card is just fantastic. It's a four four flyer for floor four, which is an instant include every single time and a rather high pick. Getting to Scry of Return, we've already talked about in today's uh, review as being incredible and just an absolutely massively powerful effect. And the bonus of getting to reveal this and set up your first three, four, if you mulligan to turns, is absolutely amazing. It's an easy first pick every time it's in the pack, and I, I, I don't quite think it's an A+. I feel like five is usually the toughness where these amazing creatures with, with amazing words become an A+, plus, but no. You know what? A+, plus for Sphinx of Foresight. It's going to feel great to keep a one lander with this in hand and, and set up your turn and somehow still get mana screwed. Anyways, A+, plus for Sphinx of Foresight. Up next is Swirling Torrent. Swirling Torrent is five and a blue for a sorcery at uncommon. Choose one or both. Put target creature on top of its owner's library. Return target creature to its owner's hand. Uh, six mana sorcery, bounce, and put on top of library is pretty cool. Like, I think I love this, even though it's pricey, just because I do really, really love bounce. I'll start out playing it probably too much. This should be kind of like the tempo very top end that you need to finish off the game. Uh, of course, I wish it was instance, but this removes two blockers 
and could just end the game. Removing two blockers may be more than enough for you to get the damage through to just end things. It's probably a totally fine C+. It's no higher because the cost is definitely restrictive. This thing sucks before turn six or seven or eight or so. Um, so yeah, know when to cut this because you absolutely should be cutting this probably an okay amount of the time, but the times that you don't, it's going to be pretty solid. C plus for Swirling Torrent. Thought Collapse is up next. Thought Collapse is one blue blue for an instant at common counter target spell. Its controller puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. Uh, no interest. It, I, I don't need my counter spells to do something like mill three. I need them to draw me a card. I need them to scry. I need them to do something really good. Milling three is literally meaningless unless that's their last three cards. Um, not good. This is sideboard only. It's more playable in sealed because sealed is slower. There's more rares. There's more bombs, etc. Uh, but in draft, this is like just a straight up D. Uh, but what about the mill plan? We'll talk about that in a couple of cards. Up next is Verity Circle. Verity Circle is two and a blue for an enchantment at rare. Whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't being declared as an attacker, you may draw a card. Pay four and a blue, tap target creature without flying. So there's your way of tapping a creature without it uh, being uh, an attacker. Uh, hey, look, it's another bad enchantment at rare. This is begging for a slow format and with afterlife and adapt and riot and the blue white skies deck, I have zero assumptions that this is going to be a slow format. There are some draft sets where I think this could actually be something that you're happy with and sealed. This is potentially playable, but three mana do nothing for several turns is way too costly. Then five mana to draw a card and tap a non flyer. Flyers are often the number one target for your icy manipulator. Uh, um, all in all, I think this is just an F. Maybe it's like a D plus in sealed, but this does nothing for so long and, and, and then costs so much to do so little. So I'm, I'm at an F on Verity Circle. Uh, just another bad enchantment to throw into the pile. F for Verity Circle. Our second last card is Wall of Lost Thoughts. Wall of Lost Thoughts is one in a blue for a creature wall at uncommon. It's an 0-4 with Defender, so it's just a less good Wall of Mist, but... When Wall of Lost Thoughts enters the battlefield, put target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. More mill! Uh, yeah, I don't really care about this. Um, Wall of Mist is very much like a C minus D plus kind of card. Taking a toughness off of it, meaning that it dies easier, is definitely making it worse. Now, what about the mill deck? What about the mill deck? The mill deck that exists in this format requires multiple cards. It requires several copies of Thought Collapse. It requires multiple copies of Wall of Lost Thoughts. It requires multiple copies of Persistent Practitioner or of Screaming Shield. Persistent Practitioner and Screaming Shield, in order to continually mill, costs mana. Which means you're going to have to stop playing magic to an extent to mill your opponent, which, remember, does nothing. It literally does nothing unless you're milling their last card. So the mill deck I don't believe is real. Yes, somebody will actually get all of these cards together by luck of the draw and it will happen once, but I wouldn't go out on a limb and try to do it. Sure, on stream, when I'm bored, maybe had a beer, yeah, I might give it a try, but you really, 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 really should not. D for Wall of Lost Thoughts. And our final blue card for today is Windstorm Drake. Windstorm Drake is four and a blue for a creature Drake at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 three, three with flying. Other creatures you control with flying get plus one, plus zero. This, of course, is the uh, opposite of the plus O, oh, plus one. This is basically the uh, Battleground Geist from Innistrad, except that gave uh, plus one, plus O oh to your spirits, which were typically your flyers anyways, but otherwise it was the same card. Uh, yeah, this is much, 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 much better than the plus one, plus O, oh, uh, or sorry, plus O, oh, plus one, because you want to be attacking with your flyers. What you do in the Blue White Skies deck is you drop maybe like a wall or something you drop some flyers you tap down creatures you bounce creatures you you cause your opponent some uh, uh some troubles and some delays as you attack them you drop this on turn five suddenly every single flyer you have is is plus one power bigger and, and you maybe finish them that turn or you finish them very very quickly in the next few turns this is a great curve dropper the second you know you're in blue white skies you definitely want to be grabbing this uh blue green 
probably wants this a lot less. There are certainly some blue green flyers, uh, but I'm not sold on uh, uh, Simic having that many flyers going on. So Windstorm Drake, amazing blue white skies payoff. The second you know you're heading towards there, you certainly pick this card up. Uh, I've got this card at like a B minus, uh, maybe even a B. Uh, you know what? Let's go up to a B, assuming we're in blue-white skies. It does drop down to more like a C plus, uh, B minus, if you uh, uh, don't have that many flyers. So B for Windstorm Drake. So that's going to wrap it up for blue. Blue looks pretty darn decent. I am super excited for the blue white flyers deck uh tempo aggro is one of my favorite things to play in uh limited now there's some interesting stuff of course we talked about that mill deck and i don't think it's going to exist and yes at some point i'll give it a try just to shut people up but uh we've got an a plus in sphinx of foresight there's some powerful cards in here and very excitingly the bad enchantment that every color gets was actually good here with eyes everywhere uh verity circle of course though i don't think is nearly as good uh but yeah i'm super excited to play blue i really want to play blue white spear uh blue white flyers uh blue green simic is definitely on my uh my radar as well but let me know what cards you're excited about what cards you agreed with what cards you disagreed with etc talk to me talk to each other down in the comments below as always if you have any questions comments or suggestions you can find me on twitter at the man leak that's l-e-e-k like the vegetable not the card you can also find me at facebook.com slash the man leak twitch.tv slash the man leak uh and patreon.com slash the man leak remember i will be streaming ravnica allegiance one day early on Arena uh, over on twitch.tv slash the Mandalik on Wednesday, January 16th. And then on the 17th, I'll be drafting it some more. Uh, sorry, I won't be drafting it. I'll be playing it. I'll be playing Sealed on Wednesday. I'll be drafting what I can or playing Sealed on Thursday as well as doing that Marble Grand Prix where you can get yourself a free playmat uh, from 8gaming.com. If you do want to buy something from there, use the promo code Mandalik10, all one word, one zero as the number to get 10% off your order. If you like the content, click thumbs up, click subscribe if you want to see more. And if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to be back here same time, maybe, tomorrow for the Black Set Review.